This program is made possible by the generous partners of Dwayne Miller Ministries. Stay tuned for a message that will strengthen your faith. Get ready for insightful teachings, uplifting testimonies, and practical wisdom that will encourage you to live in victory. Welcome to Today with Dwayne and Cameron Miller. Hey, Pastor Dwayne, along with my beautiful bride, Cameron, we want to invite you into a Sunday service. This has been previously recorded, but it is one of our Sunday services. And this message, I pray, is going to be a blessing to you as well as the atmosphere of our congregation. So God bless you as you join us in one of our Sunday services. And then nobody fell out. It's okay. And then when he finished, he looked at us and he said, now knowing what these people, and I don't have time to tell you their stories, but let me tell you, they all went through some serious stuff. When he came to the end, he said, now how many of you would like to be where they are, knowing what price they had to pay to get there? Right. Nobody raised their hand. Because I can assure you, if you just knew the stories, I mean, when Charles Stanley became the pastor of First Baptist Atlanta, the night he was voted in, one of the deacons stormed the platform and hit him square in the face. Blood flying everywhere. That man went through, I mean, hell on earth to pastor that church. Among other things in his own, his own personal family that I won't mention or get into. And then when you see let me just say that when you see these great people standing in the pulpits, and I won't mention names, but maybe somewhere in life some of them had a little hiccup or a little, you know, maybe they, maybe they had a little fall. And maybe the enemy had a heyday in their life for a day or two. You don't know what they were going through, what they went through, and you don't know what happened. And I promise you, God's a God of restoration and forgiveness. And thank God we've watched some great men and women of God who had a moment that God said, "That's look, my grace is sufficient. And he picked them up and put them back into what he called them to do. I may not even agree with a lot of them, but thank God they're still standing. Because that same grace that God gave them, I've needed in my own life. Why am I telling you this? And I'm going to get to the sermon in a moment. It's going to be short. You don't believe it, but it, I promise when I get there. You want an anointing? I've, I've been in ministry where I've gone and young ministers come and say, man, will you lay hands on me and impart your anointing to me? And I've said, no, I can't do that. I believe in the impartation laying on the hand. I believe in all that, but you can't have my anointing. You haven't walked through what I've gone through to get there. You can have your anointing. These two books are the product of a wilderness journey. A journey that if you read them, you wouldn't want to sign up for. I wouldn't sign up to go back through what I've been through for anything in the world. But I'm thankful that I made it through it. I assure you, sweet Cameron would not sign up to go through what she went through and what she calls her pit season from 2014 until two years ago. And she's about finished with her real story, the story of restoration, writing that book. But you don't know the cost of the wilderness. And I'm not blowing smoke about us. You could say that about every great man and woman of God. You have your story. You've walked through pain. You've walked through trials and tests. And you've walked through seasons of dryness. And, and, and you've lived in the wilderness alone. And you've cried out to God. And there were nights when it didn't seem like he was listening and he wasn't there. You've prayed and believed and stood but God wants you to understand that he allowed you. He didn't cause those seasons, but he allowed you to go through those seasons so that you could come to a place like Moses and say, surely 
He will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and the perilous pestilence. I've walked out in the wilderness. I've faced the devil eye to eye, and I'm still standing today. So if you're taking notes, point number one in this protocol to prosperity called invincibility, you learn that you're invincible because number one, he is your deliverer. Moses said, this is what I know. Surely he will deliver me from the snare. Now, if he's going to deliver me, he didn't say he's going to deliver me from the enemy. He said he was going to deliver me from the snare of the enemy, which presupposes I've gotten caught in the enemy's trap. Whether it's by my own choice and bad decisions, or whether it is the enemy who snuck up on me and I let my guard down and now I find myself ensnared and trapped by him. Moses said it doesn't make any difference. He will deliver you out of the trap of the enemy. Whether you took the bait or you were blindsided, here's what you can know about your God. He will deliver you. When religion gives up on you, and when the church says about you you're disqualified because you made a bad decision, you took the bait, you ended up in the snare, Jesus says, I'm your deliverer. Yes. Why do you think I died? Right. I died to give me the legal right to deliver you, yes. even from yourself. I've needed to be delivered from Dwayne Miller a whole lot more than the devil, I can tell you that. Amen. I've learned in 39 years of preaching this August the 25th, John Looney sitting over here, and I went to Central Baptist College in August of 1985 in Conway. We looked up in the registration line and saw each other. Didn't even know each, we would even be there. We grew up as childhood friends. Our earliest memories of being in the nursery at Unity Baptist Church, DeWitt, Arkansas, where my dad pastored. Known this guy as long as I have a memory. Back to three years old, four years old, he and I used to sit in uh, Mona Sue Biswanger's front yard and play with matchbox cars. We'd take spoons and we'd dig out roads in the, in the dirt and we'd We'd make mud pies and throw them in each other's face. <laughs> One day, my, my late wife, Amy, uh, grew up with us as well. We were all babysat by Mona Sue. And one day I was over at John's house and he told me that Amy was his girlfriend and I got him down in the ditch and beat the daylights out of him. <laughs> he's always been bigger than me, but you know, he's, he's, uh, he's, not a, he's a lover, he's not a fighter. That's a true story. I've apologized to him since, kind of, sort of, a little bit. But I've learned. I don't know why I got off onto that story, but we, we went and enrolled in, in Central Baptist College 39 years ago this August. And in all of these years, I have learned this, that this, this will help you in ministry, is that you are most vulnerable to the trap of the devil as you're coming out of your greatest season of success and victory. You're in a Holy Ghost service. God anoints you. God uses you. Signs, wonders, miracles, salvations. You're at your most vulnerable, vulnerable, vulnerable when you walk out of that service. And the anointing subsides and your flesh screams. I'm just going to be real with you. One of the reasons why some of us people in ministry have to remain disciplined about our weight is because when you leave a service at 10 o'clock at night and you've been under a holy, powerful anointing, you could eat the side of a house. <laughs> your flesh is now awakened. 
I'm just being real with you. So that's why a lot of people in ministry battle with their weights because your flesh is now at its most vulnerable point. Some of the greatest attacks and temptations have come after me, leaving meetings where the power of God were, were moving. Now, I didn't say I yielded to them. I just said they showed up. So you have to understand you're invincible. But you're invincible when you are living in the Holy of Holies. And surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he talks about being caught up into heaven. And as soon as he comes out of that experience, can you imagine being translated into heaven and then coming back? And the first thing he reminds himself and all of us when he comes back from that heavenly encounter is about the thorn in the flesh. Now there are people written books about Paul's thorn. I have my theory. I've got the pulpit. I'll tell you what it was. You can preach it your way when you, when you have the pulpit. Amen. I believe Paul's thorn in the flesh was when he tended to get into his emotions and his flesh and sense and feel the rejection of his own people. It, I don't believe it was his eyesight. I don't believe it was a physical infirmity. Paul so loved Israel. And God called this Pharisee of Pharisees out of that post to be the apostle to the Gentiles. And because of that, the disciples themselves, even Peter, rejected him, argued with him, didn't like him because they felt like he was taking the gospel and somehow he was betraying his background. And he was totally and completely rejected. Anytime he came to Jerusalem, he was totally and completely. When he wrote, I believe, the book of Hebrews, he didn't sign it because he knew if he put his name on it, they would, these Hebrew believers would not read it. And I believe that Paul suffered from a longing of wanting the love and acceptance of his family, his homeland, his people, and he was rejected. And I believe he suffered from dealing with that emotional pain and trauma of never being accepted. Now, that's my personal opinion. Amen. You'll never experience loneliness like you will experience and live in the wilderness when God's called you out, set you apart, and you're on a journey for the kingdom of God. The most lonely place on this earth is in ministry. Amen. Except you have the big burly breasted almighty to come home to every night. And you lay on his breast and he comforts you and he becomes enough. Amen. I remember early in my ministry, I used to watch John Hagee just obsessively. I watched him every day. And I remember him saying, and he spoke this to me. It's as if God put my name on it. Because I was a young pastor full of ambition. And I want to tell you, ambition is the death of anointing. I said ambition is the death of anointing. Your ambition can take your gifting, and your gifting can take you to fulfill your ambition, but there's no anointing. You better listen to me. Ambition is the death of anointing. And I was an ambitious young guy. I was determined to pastor a church of thousands and thousands and, you know, be famous and all of that. And I was constantly griping and complaining to God about being stuck in South Arkansas of all places. Back in those days, it was a two-lane road from Little Rock to Eldorado. You couldn't get there from here. I wasn't sure Jesus knew where Eldorado was. <laughs> now, I was there. And just like God, he made me live there for a quarter of a century. A quarter of a century I stayed there. I was complaining and I was, you know, the one thing that God cannot bless is ingratitude. All you're doing when you're mully grubbing and complaining to God, why, when, why me, why not, is you're just prolonging, prolonging, and prolonging your destiny. Yes, right. He's just going to let you stay in the wilderness for another year <laughs> till you get sick of yourself. Good. But I'm sitting there watching John Hagee, and he said this. He said, if you can't be grateful where you are, what makes you think you'll be grateful for 
where you want to go. If you can't be grateful and satisfied and rejoice with what you have, what makes you think you'll be happy when God gives you what you think you want? If you can't celebrate and praise the Lord where you're living at right now, what makes you think that you'll be any happier and more satisfied when you get to live where you think you want to live with what you think you want to have? You see, God cannot bring you to a place of prosperity if your heart is ungrateful. Paul reminds us about that thorn in the flesh. I'm hurrying, I promise. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, but he reminds us that God is faithful. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is his common demand. But God is faithful. Everybody say, God is faithful. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with that temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Amen. Now that verse doesn't say that God brings temptation to you. That verse says that when you come into that place of testing, and that's really what it means is testing. He's already provided a way out. And you know what that way out is? It's in the Holy of Holies. If you're suffering with the temptation of your flesh, and you're wanting to climb out of bed at midnight and go eat a bucket of fried chicken... You can't eat Kentucky Fried Chicken at midnight if you're praying in tongues. <laughs> you're thinking bad thoughts about somebody that did something to you or didn't to you. I promise you, those thoughts evaporate when you start praying in the Holy Ghost. Your flesh is being tempted to lust or whatever it might be. You start praying in the Holy Ghost and I promise you, it, it'll evaporate from your mind. The moment you say Jesus, you're repositioning yourself in the Holy of Holies. I realize he's in you and he's ever present with you, but in your conscious mind, you have to put yourself in the Holy of Holies. And when you're there, I assure you, Moses said, God will deliver you. In 2 Corinthians 4.12, he said, death is working in us life. 2 Corinthians 10.4, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. Romans 8.37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors. The word in the Greek, there's we are supra conquerors. We, we are above and beyond conquerors through him that loved us. Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Now listen, that verse is not saying that somehow you become more spiritual if you go through suffering. What it's saying is, is that you have, anytime you read the word suffering, and Paul writes, uses that word a lot, the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory. He's not talking about going through pain and heartache and trial. The word suffering here is this. It is the battle I have between my flesh and my spirit. And the suffering that I deal with trying to keep my flesh tamed, trying to keep my flesh from getting angry, trying to keep my flesh from lusting, trying to keep my flesh from wanting more, trying to keep my flesh from giving you the fivefold ministry upside your head when you act like an idiot. <laughs> Hear me. In this season of what's going on in America, and now we see the snakes and the vipers and the evil, it's so obvious the greatest battle, we must get control of our flesh and not come down to the devil's level, but we must stay in the Holy of Holies where we can legislate the will of God from heaven to earth. Yeah. And understand that God has already given the victory. Yeah. Everybody say, he is my deliverer. Paul does not have some warped sense and point of view that suffering and failure somehow makes us more spiritual. He's simply saying that when you get your flesh in check, now you learn to understand that it's not even worth your time to acknowledge your flesh when you compare the glory that God has given you through Jesus Christ. Notice, surely he will deliver you from the snare. Surely he will deliver you from the perilous pestilence. That term, perilous pestilence, means 
an unexpected plague resulting in death. I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. And I'm not going to apologize for it. If it offends you, build a bridge and get over it. I agree with Dr. Randy Caldwell, Bishop Steve McEwen. I've heard them both say this. I've said it. But in 2020, when that plague hit America, the China virus, we learned how faithless the church of Jesus Christ really is. And when you take someone like me, I had to say, have I wasted my life trying to preach to people about faith only to watch them succumb to the fear of the perilous pestilence. Amen. Now look, whatever you did with your bodies between you and the Lord, I'm not your Holy Spirit. But I can tell you this, that's the only vaccine I need. Now if you want to put your faith and, and look, if he got it or he didn't get it, I don't know. It's a sure terrible testimony to the vaccine when Biden, if he did actually have COVID, had been given the vaccine and two boosters and he still came down with it if he actually had it. My point is this. You have to understand in the Holy of Holies, you're invincible. Amen. The devil cannot kill you. And I know people say to me, well, your wife died. My wife chose to be promoted to heaven. God revealed that to me clearly through two prophets. Amen. Same thing with Connie. She chose. Jesus came. Hey, look, Jesus shows up in your house tonight and shows you heaven and says, you want to come with me? Hey, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> but he's not going to do this until you've run your race and finished your course. Worry, doubt, and fear will make you sick. Bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, bearing about in your body what someone did to you and living as a victim, it will make you sick. But he said, in the Holy of Holies, you have been inoculated with the blood of the Lamb and you are off limits to the enemy. Now point number two and I'm finished. He's my deliverer and he is my defense, number two. Hallelujah. I've got four little sub points out of these verses from four, verse four to verse eight. Write them down and then shout. Okay? That's really good stuff. He shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. How does God defend you? Number one, he's got me covered in the storm. Yeah. He's got me covered in the storm. Yeah. I've been through a lot of storms in my life. I've been in places of darkness and pain in levels that I didn't know existed. And I wouldn't go back through it again for nothing. Amen. But I promise you, even when I was angry. People think that's blasphemous for me to say I got angry at God. Well, pen a rose on your nose. I'm not as spiritual as you are. <laughs> when my wife died, I was ticked off. Right. I lived what the Bible said. When the Bible said, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even your faith. Because for 45 days, I walked in that room and I quoted 101 healing scriptures to her body, fully expecting her to get up. Prayed for God to raise her from the dead when her heart stopped beating. That was not failure. It was victory for her. Now I had a choice. Give up and let the enemy win or stand in faith and say, devil, I'm going to make you pay every day of your life. Amen. 
The victory is standing there over a grave, knowing this is not the end, but Jesus has overcome. And there is a day of resurrection that has been promised. You have to come to that place where you're like Peter and you say, Lord, where am I going to go and to who am I going to turn? You alone have the words of life. I don't have a backup plan. I don't have a plan B if this thing doesn't work out. I didn't sign up for this because it was a great career choice. Or so. I, Listen, I didn't even want to do this. God called me to this. and He didn't give me a choice. So I had to learn to make the best of it. And I wouldn't do anything else. Now, if he backed me up to 18 years old and gave me two options and they were his will, I might choose to do something different. Because <laughs> he didn't read the fine print in the contract for me. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. He's speaking here of an analogy of the great eagle. Do you know what the bald eagle does every morning of its life? The bald eagle every morning of its life stands on the rock facing the sun and takes over 3,000 feathers one at a time in its mouth where it steam cleans and secretes an oil onto each feather. So the bald eagle begins its day on the rock in the sun, cleaned, sanctified, and anointed. So that when it flies 200 miles an hour and hits that lake and takes that fish. Karen and I thank you for joining us in today's broadcast where we previously recorded a sermon on Sunday. And we hope it was a blessing to you to come into our congregation and our atmosphere on a Sunday morning service. Until next time, God bless you. To contact this ministry, visit our website at www.dwaynemiller.com. You can email us at info at or send your letters to Post Office Box 1331 Cabot, Arkansas 72023. We would love to pray for you. If you need prayer, please call 888-997-2387. Please join us in person at The Edge Church on Sundays at 10.30 a.m. We are located at 6702 TP White Drive, Cabot, Arkansas, 72023. This program is available to watch on demand. Visit our website, YouTube channel, or the following streaming platforms to catch up on any episodes you may have missed. To stay connected with us, follow us on social media. Find us on Facebook at Dwayne Miller Ministries or on X at Dr. Underscore Dwayne Miller. This program was made possible by the generous partners of Dwayne Miller Ministries. If this broadcast is a blessing to you, please consider partnering with us. You can text GIVE at 501-237-5676 or give online at www.dwaynemiller.com. Thanks for watching Today with Dwayne and Cameron Miller.